Welcome to Vacation Station, hosted by Lisa and Nancy, editors of BigBlendMagazines.com. Glenn Burroughs, family history expert and owner of Norfolk Tours in England, is back on Big Blend Radio's Vacation Station show today to tell us about some of his family history and how it led to two visits to Canada with his recent visit, uh, exploring Eastern Canada, including its national parks, all kinds of communities. And, you know, he really got to a place where one of his ancestors were. I mean, to stand there and be overseas and go to where one of your ancestors were from exciting. England. It's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. And meet current, you know, current family, uh, you know, and relatives. So a very exciting story. His article and photos are featured in the October through December issue of Parks and Travel magazine. And you can also read it right on nationalparktraveling.com and see his other articles there too. He's also one of our expert contributors in Big Blend Radio and TV magazine, which you can see at blendradioandtv.com. And uh, the best thing, though, is go visit Glenn on his website, norfolk-tours.co.uk. He puts amazing travels. Well, you're basically, he works on the itinerary and does all the details um, for you when you come over to England, and he'll take you anywhere you want to go and take you to see whatever you want to see and help you even find your ancestors and where they live. So uh, very cool stuff indeed. Glenn, how are you? I'm fantastic today. Thanks very much. Hey, good, good. That means you must have had a cheese scone today. <laughs> Funnily enough, you, you you mentioned that um, I was away um, with some guests over the weekend, and when I came home, guess what? My lovely wife had made me a little tin full of cheese scones, and I finished <gasps> the last one this morning. Oh, oh, that is a good breakfast. There's nothing uh, like a good <laughs> it's not a very good scone. breakfast, really, but that's the oh. that's the one I had anyway. Oh, I know, because when you have a, a proper English breakfast, breakfast, that's a big spread. I mean, I remember, oh, yeah. like, fried tomatoes, sausage, or steak and eggs, right? And, no, no, uh, no, 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 no. Eggs, eggs, bacon, and sausage, uh, that will do. Okay. Now, when you went to Canada, did you get a good, did they serve English breakfast over there? Well, a couple of the places we were at served a type of English breakfast, but the ones that really impressed me were the the little tiny bed and breakfasts that we stayed in mm -hmm. that served all the beautiful yogurts and fresh fruit and, you know, the, the real fresh eggs. There was one we stayed at in St. Andrews um, and it, he served, on one day he served um, a beautiful fresh yogurt with um, a fruit salad with it and then followed by... Uh, well, it was a cross between um, an omelette and a poached egg. It was it it's, it was um, it was a strange concoction, but it was absolutely gorgeous. And um, that's the sort of thing I love to try because that's something I wouldn't normally do at home. And it it was it was something that you know was what he made, or it was his wife who was cooking in the kitchen. But um, you know, it's something really different. So that, that's what I uh, that's what I enjoy doing is is try the local dishes and uh, mm -hmm. see what they can offer. And it's, the nice thing is it's all lovely and fresh. So mm -hmm. You know what you're getting. I love this. I love yeah. this journey that you took. And I want to. I know this is the second trip to Canada, and this was was like a 16 day road trip. Now that's how Nancy and I travel, right? And I hope you were playing Willie Nelson in the car on the road again, <laughs> on the way or in, well, in the van. You know, we were, um, we were playing. One of the uh, one of the cousins were fitted it up to the um, to the radio on the on the on the minibus, and so we were getting all different playlists from people of my age put their playlist together from their phones, and then there was uh, the younger cousins. They were putting their playlists together, but there was lots of singing, and. Um, there was even some dancing going on at one stage, um, which probably wasn't very good for the driver, but uh, we all had fun. That's awesome. Now, did you all take That's turns cool. dri driving? Did you? Did no, you take a turn? No, there was um, there was four <laughs> drivers. Wow! Wow! Four yeah. drivers, and you. So you didn't want to do the other side of the road? No, Isn't thank it weird? you. It's no, weird, I don't want it? to do that. 
Yeah, I, yeah. I, it's not something I want, especially with the dozen people in a minibus. It's not a good idea. No, no, no. I remember it was whenever I took a, a left-hand tour, it's I so got all twirled around. Yeah. It took me a while to get used to this, the other side of the road yeah. here. And, and uh, you know, that's why never drink after a glass of champagne in this country, and you shouldn't anyway. But um, no, 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 you can't. It's it's a it's a it's a weird thing. But this is so exciting. The story of uh, connecting with your family in Canada, and I just think, you know, over the years, Glenn, you've you've opened our eyes to the different. It's like solving these mysteries, right? These people mysteries, these family mysteries of who did what, where, and when, you know. And um, this is one of those stories that I find is like one of the best ever um, because it, it goes into the past and it brings you into the present and true connectivity. Um, so tell us about how this all started and connecting with your, your relatives in Canada and then finding an ancestor's footsteps, literally. Yeah, I mean, back in about 1977, I was um, doing, some, doing some work in, in the church for a, a display we were having. and um, I started to do my family history, and then mm -hmm. soon after that, I was looking at the visitors' book, and there was a, a man had visited from Nottinghamshire, funnily enough, and said that um, this is where his ancestor used to live, and it was a name that I was researching. So I contacted him. He then gave me information about his side of the family, and also the fact that one of his cousins, um, was living in Canada, or two of his cousins were living in Canada, actually. So he gave me their addresses, and I um, I contacted them, and I've been writing to them for a few years. When in 1987, um, one of the daughters of one of the cousins actually came over and visited, and then um, wow. one of the other cousins came over in 2015, and then they they were they're all lovely, but the um, the husband of one of my cousins said, when you come to Canada, and he wouldn't let us not put a date in the diary. <laughs> so we we said, right, we'll come next August, and he wouldn't let it rest. And I'd like to thank him very much for not letting it rest, <laughs> because we ended up going to Canada that next August. And wow. then then last year, one of the other cousins came over, and we decided we'd go back again this year, so we went back. And and it is all completely down to the fact that I've been researching my family history. If I hadn't yeah. have been researching my family history, I wouldn't have made contact with the man who came to Wiesnham from Nottingham, who put his name in the book. I wouldn't have contacted those people in Canada in 1977, and I wouldn't have known of their existence. And those people who have been over here wouldn't have probably come to England because wow. they had no need to come to England. Wow, so, the power of the past, you know? Well, the, the, and, the power of whatever people like to call coincidence, you know, hmm. the coincidence that this man came to Wiesnam, the coincidence that I read his name and contacted him, the coincidence that I kept in touch with all the family in Canada, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's wow. just amazing. And and the thought that you may you may never have gone to Canada at all if you weren't doing your family history. I, I would have had you know? no need to go, no reason to go. This, I mean, this is amazing. So now, so these are all distant cousins of yours yes. that, that you met, and their family. And now, you know, you're saying there's 16 of you on this road trip, and no, 12. Um, 12, 12, yeah, 16 days, 12 people. <laughs> it's yeah, it's, yeah. Um, I'm just expanding your family for you. Um, right. But now, when you went over a couple of years ago, you had you went more on the west side, and and you, you know, you, you got to see sta the same statue over there of uh, Mr. Vancouver, oh, <laughs> over yeah. uh, that you have in in your area in England, in yep. Norfolk area, and then uh, so there was these connections there. Um, but you got to explore, you got to see bears. So you went to some national parks on the western side of Canada last time. Yeah, we went um, from Calgary right the way across to Vancouver Island. So we went through uh, Jasper Park, mm. um, and then we went uh, to Banff, and that's all. I think mm. that's all all national parks all the way across the mountains there. There's, there's quite a few different, but I remember Jasper Park. I remember the mm. name of Jasper. 
Um, but there were several parks that we drove through because we drove all the way from Calgary to Vancouver Island. Um, mm. So we went through so many absolutely mind-blowing areas. The mountains, the, you know, the, the, the lakes, the, the colours. I mean, mm. sometimes when I look back at my pictures, I, I think, you know, have they been touched up, you know, on, on the computer? But they haven't. They're all proper natural colours. Mm. So you don't actually need to enhance colours of nature because they're amazing already, you know. Even even the, the white of the snow mm. is an amazing it's a I don't know, it sort of it shines, it glistens. It you you can't possibly make that any better than it already is. And the right. blues of the lakes up there are just amazing. And, and then so on the really east coast clear. You know, yeah. the, the greens and the blues again. I mean, mm. uh, I've taken pictures and the the blues of the sea and the sky, mm. they're all different different blues. You know, you, you could almost paint a picture with just blue. And you've got so many different colours of blue. It's just amazing. And when you're going through the valleys, you know, the, you've got nothing but trees on the mountainside. And you could paint that with with nothing but green, you know. And yeah. that it must be absolutely amazing to be able to paint and yeah, to Nancy. be able to capture that. I'd love well, to be that's able. That's what to Nancy do that. does. Yeah, that's that's well, your that's own... to, to do that must be amazing. Mm -hmm. it, it's fun. Yeah, you know? it makes you really observe. Yeah, yeah it makes you look. Have, yeah. yeah, yeah. You really have to observe, and then you break it down. You know, mm -hmm. like okay, blue is blue. Well, no, there's like. I've once made 62 shades of black. How about that? Well, yeah, exactly. You know, it's amazing. It's blues, it's, it's like hundreds, hundreds. Of shades. Yeah. yeah, I, as a kid, I used to, I used to watch her paint, and it was just like this amazing process. And I think that's where I learned attention to detail and and mm -hmm. how to observe like nature. Between that yeah. and actually observing nature on a daily mm -hmm. basis, um, as a kid, and it to me, it's when you when you take that in. I think it's really important what you're saying, Glenn, because sometimes when we travel, we're just, you know, people are watching movies in the car and I, you know, and, and <laughs> yeah, things I know. Like, I'm just like, yeah. stop it. Yeah. <laughs> stop it and look out the window. There's always windows. something. There's <laughs> always something to look at. And to oh, me, yeah. that's part of it is like, wow, look at this, you know, and, and taking in those colors and pulling over, getting that breath of air. And uh, I was going through your, your photos and videos of, oh, of your trip, uh, this one going on the east side. Mm. And, I mean, it almost looks like mountain and, and almost tropical in some way. Like the greens, it, it feels dewy, like that it's got a little bit of humidity. Was, did you get a little humidity out there? Because it just felt... I don't know. Lush is a good word. It's lush. Yeah. I mean, there were some places that were really, really humid. Um, but it was, it was, um, I don't know, one minute you're, you're really, really hot and humid. And then if you just move a little bit, you're, you're in the shadow of the, of the, the rocks or something, or you're just near the coast and you're getting a lovely breath of fresh air and, and that's nice and cool again. But I mean, we were traveling in in August, and it and it was quite hot. Mm. But actually, it was it was quite bearable, because oh, wow. we we were near the coast for a lot of the time. And you know, mm. being on Prince Edward Island and and out on uh, Breton Island and you know Nova Scotia, mm. we went far away from the sea, and uh, you know that was that was amazing, absolutely amazing. And like you say, you just got to look. Now, why people, like you say, don't look when they're anywhere? It's mm. just I don't know. But that's they're up to them. If they, you know, if, they, if they want to go to A, A to B and read a book all the way, that's up to them. But I I don't. I'm looking out of the window all the time. Yeah, <laughs> you know? I mean that's why I you go. And, and you know, and isn't it interesting also um, going in, and having this family experience because you're not seeing them every day of your life, you know? No, um, and so they're 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 not strangers, but they're you know new people, you know, and, and they're yes. connecting. Did you find like you know traveling and going on a road trip is one of the quickest ways to get to know people? And, that's for and sure. sometimes, <laughs> you, I mean, sometimes you you really wish you didn't go with somebody on a road trip. Um, and yeah. and but the majority of the time it's good, you know. But did you learn um, more about each other, and did you find 
common ground in things that you do sim like in you know similar habits and and things like that yeah it's, it is it is quite a a steep learning curve about people and yeah. how to how to get on with people mm -hmm. but you know as I, I as when we finished you know we we did a little photo montage cuz one of my cousins is making a little video and nice. we you know we did a little photo montage of all of us strangling each other because <laughs> it, it it didn't actually turn out like that at all but it could so easily because you know you you've got 12 people in close proximity for a long period of time mm -hmm. but it was actually quite good because you know we all took time out when we needed to so you know we didn't all eat together all the time we didn't all walk around together all the time no. so it was it was good um mm. but yes i mean talking about getting to know someone one of my cousins is called tom now tom mm. is a real character he's he really is a character he is um he's very um, very clever he's a i don't know whether he's actually a professor but i know he teaches sound technology or something at a, at a college or a university or something um and he reminds me so much of my uncle my mum's brother oh wow um and, and he is blood relation to my uncle because it, tom is just such a character yeah, he really is a character and and i always say to i said you are so much like my uncle jeff it's unbelievable not to look at but by by the way he is by his character mm. and and it is quite amazing the you know the the things that that i discovered about them and obviously they discovered about me while we're in close proximity like that you know and and like i say living with somebody in a but well, we didn't we didn't all share a room obviously but you know we we all sort of were in close proximity for 16 days so you do get to know people and wow. it it really it really was a really exciting thing to do and mm. every time we go you know we come home feeling as if we're closer family than ever before and also mm. we feel that we've known each other for years mm. and actually we haven't that's amazing isn't it I mean, this yeah. again comes from you digging around in family history, and here it is: these big yeah. adventures, these connections, and that's very powerful. Tell us about some of the places you went. Um, so you you were traveling east pretty much, and you went yes. to Quebec. You went to oh my gosh, the list is this was this was a trip. This is a road trip. But um, let's start with uh, Cape Breton Island. Um, what was uh, that like? That was probably my favorite because we went around the Cabot Trail and that was all around the the coast on the left hand side of the island and that was just spectacular um the, when we first sort of started on the trail itself we we stopped the minibus for a, a you know a view and then a few minutes later we'd stop for another view and then a few minutes later we'd stop for another view and Sarah one of my cousins She's one of the younger members of the family. She's the other generation, you know. Mm -hmm. um, she she sort of took charge, um, and she she said, "Look, if we're going to stop like this, we're going to have to get out of the van, have a little walk about, and get back in again. Because if we stop and we spend a half an hour at every place, we're never going to get round in time because we had the next hotel booked at the end of the yeah. trial. Um, so thanks to her, we got got ourselves organised." And you know, took a quarter of an hour at each stop instead instead of half an hour, because you know you you get out of the minibus, you want to stretch your legs, but you want to just take in all the views because they are spectacular. Mm -hmm. And you know, the the number of people we saw who were doing the same sort of thing, you know, it was quite amazing. There was one um, one family from Quebec. Um, they were actually cycling around there. And you know that that was quite brave of them because that was quite hilly, but um, yeah, that, it's a fantastic, a really fantastic place to to just take a good look. I mean, if there's anywhere that I want to go back to, it's definitely there. Wow! And, and wow. I'd like to go back to Quebec as well, but um, but that's yeah. because I love speaking French. But the yeah. the island was amazing. 
so Quebec, this is, you know, we've actually done a couple interviews over the years and they have this huge festival every year where people dress up and um, it, Quebec looks so fantastic. When you were putting photos on Facebook, I thought, wow, you're in Guernsey. That's where it reminded me of was Guernsey. Yeah. And I thought, what are you doing? You're back in England. And then I was like, this is more like Guernsey and that, that must be the French influence on it. it just Because Guernsey yeah. has those little, you know, cobblestone pathways and it just looked yeah. When we went to Guernsey it's in the charming. downtown, yeah, really I was like, charming. this isn't the same as England, but I always thought, it, you know, it's England, but it's not England. No. <laughs> it's, it's very the European. Channel Islands. Yeah, it, yeah, it, it is. It is really, really European and and obviously very French. Um, mm -hmm. What I loved about Quebec was the fact that it was French. You know, I mean, it, it was, mm. I'm not as well have been in France. Because wow. it, it was French in the architecture, it was French in the names on the shops, it was obviously French in the language, and and it was just so French. You know, I just loved it. In fact, one of the one of the um, bed and breakfasts that we stayed at in Riviere de Loup was um, uh, just a little. I think they they call them mum and pop um, mm -hmm. bed and breakfast in in Canada, mm -hmm. um, and the the couple were French. And um, I was speaking to them at breakfast, um, and in, in French because I, I speak French. And I said to the to the, the woman, I said, how, "How long have you been here?" Because you know, I just thought they were French. And she said, 400 years." <laughs> and, and it was then it was then that it actually dawned on me that these are the descendants of the original French settlers, yes. you know, who came there, and they. Although they still sort of think of themselves as French, they've been there for 400 years. Wow, and I was talking so cool. to someone as well when we were in Quebec um, about why the Quebec people are so adamant about you know being French and about Canada being French as well. And they they said simply that they were there first. And wow. I can understand it totally. Yeah, it is. It is right. They they were there before the English, so I can understand why they feel parochial, why they want it to be and stay French because it was theirs first. But you know, it's, going to Canada and then speaking French was my two favourite places. So it was it was I, a I really do, great combination. I have to say, the First Nation people were there first. I have to. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. 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 North yeah. American here. We have to. We have to give the. The the Indians are they, they were they were here first in America in, in the states United States and and in, in Canada and I, what I do love about Canada is they call them the first people, and the first nation and yeah. uh, gives gives them you know the respect of of them being there first but it's so interesting about who was there first mm -hmm. in in regards to England I mean we still have that going on in South Africa you know between yes. the Dutch. And the British, yes. and then you know here, there's, you know it's interesting how this this uh, who was here first, you know. To me, it's like who who you know. I don't care if you were here before me or not. Let's just get along. <laughs> That's I what well, I yes. feel like. My, yes. my so I can I can understand their um, their feeling mm -hmm. that they don't want to be overrun by the English. But right. I, I totally I totally take your point that the the, the natives were there first. Um, it, but then I was it, reading something today that um, even questioned where they came from originally. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it doesn't really matter who was there first. We've yeah. got to get on with each other. <laughs> what do you say, Nancy? It, I, my grandmother, who was from Hull in England, yeah. um, her half-sister um, lived in Canada for a while. And I know that she said that we had an Uncle Charlie in Canada and she she always wanted us to to go and visit him, but she always said he's French <laughs> and he's different. That's oh, really, really that's 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 a, that's, <laughs> that's how she said that's it. That's our family history. Yeah, he's French yeah, and he's, he's different. He's French, look, and he's different. Glenn, we're gonna find out we're related to you. <laughs> Don't be scared. <laughs> oh, be scared. <laughs> be very very scared. <laughs> no, but this is so fascinating because and then at the end of the day, when you think about it. You know, there's there's you know a lot of Scottish history in Canada and English history, French history, right? So then when people are doing their family history from France, it they, it can lead right back to Norfolk at the end exactly. of the day, right? So this opens well, the lines further. 
when it comes well, it to could connecting. do because you know if they come over to Canada from France um because you know obviously they moved around in Canada mm -hmm. so even even though they are from Quebec uh, there's quite a few um I think they call them Quebecois they um a lot of them live in other parts of Canada so you know who knows they could have married into some of my other family or some you know some other English family because mm -hmm. actually my um my cousin, um, my cousin's husband, Mario, comes from, I think it's Colombia, originally. Oh. Um, I think it's, I'm sorry, Mario, if I got that wrong, but I know it's South America. And, um, you know, oh. he's married into my family. So there's, I've got a Colombian connection as well. He's a lovely cool. bloke. He's the, one who, he's the one who made us go to Canada. <laughs> well, then he's, he's awesome, he's man. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, yeah, yeah, this is, I love this. This is so, you know, just such a good, good story. So um, I, I want to get to, you know, where you went, you walked in your ancestors footsteps. I, I want to get to that part. But I do want to talk about that you found another Nelson's column. <laughs> I did. I did. Yes. I was, I was so excited. Um, and I didn't know about it until I got there because um, we were in Montreal and although um, there were parts of Montreal that I really liked, there was, it was such a massive city um, that it, it wasn't my favorite um, because mm -hmm. it was so massive and so much, you know, a, a massive metropolitan area. But as we were um, walking around, I suddenly noticed there was a hotel called the Hotel Nelson. And that obviously caught my eye. And then I looked around and there was a big column, a big stone column with a statue on top of it. And I had a look, at, I went up and had a look at it and it was Nelson. So wow. when, I, um, when I did a bit more research, I found that actually this is the second oldest Nelson's column in the world. It's actually earlier than the Nelson's column in Trafalgar Square in London. Wow. And, um, and, and there it is in, in Canada. And, and there it is, I, I just, sort of tripped over it as, as I was walking around Montreal. You know, who can wow. believe it? But as, as I say, I'm a bit coincidences, you know, um, these coincidences are, are just everywhere. And hey. to, find Nelson, to find Nelson in, in Montreal, it made my day. It, it's really interesting, you know, that it's true. These coincidences are there. You just have to, again, have your eyes open and, mm -hmm. and yes. be able to, to receive those coincidences. It's so, it's fascinating. And, you know, so, then also, you went to the Alexander Graham Bell Museum. I would have loved to have gone there. And uh, and you said that he really now. So he's Scottish. So so that's a connection, you know, when yes. you think about it. You know, yeah. I mean, uh, most he, of our inventors here so, came from Scotland. Yeah, true. Almost all it, our inventors are Scottish. Yeah. The Scottish well, are good at be, inventing. Yeah, there yeah. Must, there must be something about that. Then have to look into that. But yeah, mm -hmm. I, Alexander Graham Bell. I I thought, oh yeah, he invented the telephone. So I thought, why do I want to go and have a look around his museum? But actually, he invented so many things. It's absolutely amazing. If you just look him up and look mm. at his inventions. I mean, he invented a, a, a triangular box kite, which they, they made an aeroplane wing out of it because it flew better than a square box kite. And he invented other aircraft. He, in, he invented, obviously, the, the, the telephone. And he, he just didn't stop inventing. He invented a lot of things to help um, deaf people because his, his wife was deaf. And that he invented loads of different things to, to help the deaf um, population. He was an absolute amazing man. He really was. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I sort of went into the museum expecting that I'm probably going to walk in there and walk out after 10 minutes. And I think we were probably there for about two and a half hours. It was just totally amazing. So, yeah, look Alexander Graham Bell up. He's a, a fascinating man. He really yeah. is. You know, the other thing I want to go back to on the history part, um, two things. Um, the one, th these build, I mean, I could just go on and on. This is incredible. The, your, your, your adventure, the, the Fundy's, the, is it the Bay of Fundy? Number yes. one, that, that sounds like an Australian name to me for some reason. But you right. never know. But these rocks and in the water with trees growing on them it's like and, a grizzly bear i know it's really <laughs> oh that one does i mean yeah. these this this is just absolutely magnificent country and then next thing you know you're at what toronto casa Loma. so now you're getting the spanish you know flair in there 
Well, um, I mean, the Bay of Sunday, they, they were saying, has is, is got the, one of the biggest tidal changes in, in the world. And wow. we, we were there um, at, the, at those rocks. And when we arrived, um, we could walk around the other side of, a, of another piece of rock that was sticking out towards the sea. And then after about five minutes, there were some, some people in, in a yellow coat telling everybody to come back. And as they were coming back, the tide was coming in, and it was coming in so quick that it was, it was just unbelievable. You know, it wow. was coming in as quick as someone would walk. And wow. by the time we'd left, the tide had cut off the, the, the way that you could have walked around that rock that was sticking out towards the sea. And, and it was just amazing. And when you look at the rocks, you can see how high the tide comes up. And, and again, that nature, you know, mm -hmm. I, never get, um, I never get tired of thinking about how amazing nature is. I mean, the, when we were in uh, St. Andrews, the, um, the, tide, the tidal difference there, again, is on the Bay of Sunday, but it's well out from where the rocks were. But... The, the tidal difference is amazing. I've, I think I sent two pictures, one with the tide out and one with the tide in. Mm -hmm. And it's just amazing. Yeah. It's just totally that's, amazing. That's, that's a trip. I mean, it really oh. is. It, it's just looking at these images. And the other part that got me was um, you went on the longest covered bridge in the world. I we're know, gonna, I love that. We're excited about that because yes. we're going to go to Kentucky on our Love Our Parks tour and go see Stephanie. Right. You've been on the show with Stephanie McMillan from yes. Springfield. Yes. And Springfield, um, named after George Washington, was Washington County. So we're going to go look up Nelson County, which is next door, just in case. You yeah. know, there's a Nelson column there. You never know. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I know it's going to be part of our tour in search of Nelson's column. You know, yeah. you never know. <laughs> Mr. Bean. I know, Mr. Bean. Mr. Bean. Um, but anyway... <laughs> When, when um, over there, they have the longest covered bridge in the state of Kentucky, you know, so right. we're going to go do that, even though I'm not too good on bridges. So what, that, is it creepy going in a covered, a, like at a covered bridge like that? No, like no, not at all. I mean, we just drove through it in a minibus and it, it was, uh, you know, it, it was just like driving through a, a, a small tunnel. You know, it, it's, it's not very big, obviously, because it was only built for horses and carts. Um, oh, yeah, that's but it was uh, it was it was very interesting. And I was saying to them, why did they cover them? And and they were saying it's it's to do with the the ice, mm. because um, mm. you know if, if if the snow gets on top of the bridge, as well as un the ice forms underneath as well, um, then obviously the the wood will rot mm. more quickly, so they they cover it. And mm. that was as simple as that. You know, they just cover it to protect it. So yeah, I mean it was it was it was something different. Um, mm. And funnily enough, when I was a, a, a youngster in the 60s, um, I had a, a, a thing called a Viewmaster, which was a stereo thing that you could look at, you know, stereo pictures through. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. actually had, I had a set of pictures of Canada and actually one of them, I haven't found them yet because they must be in the loft somewhere. Um, one of them I remember was a covered bridge. And I've always been fascinated by covered bridges, so I was thrilled to get to see that. Yeah. Wow! Seeing all these hmm. things sort of from my childhood. You know, that's amazing. but that's a. It, but see, that's part of the building of the coincidence. You know, that's the. Yeah. There's always there's clues to the quinky dinkies. That's what I always <laughs> say. Um, <laughs> one place, Ottawa, to me is is really beautiful. Those canals, you know, the with the oh, water. Yeah, yeah, that's fun. that kind of reminds me of the Norfolk Broads. Here we are. <laughs> You've got these canals. Um, well, the water it's almost like Amsterdam but what also um, these buildings are incredible um, yes, they but are. What, the the memorial to the war of 1812 it's very interesting yes. we just did an interview on this and everyone um, the story if you type in Lake Erie on nationalparktraveling.com you'll see this um, they have all these monuments we actually have a national park unit there um, named after Perry, Commodore Perry. Mm -hmm. as a, it's a peace uh, memorial, um, and it is dedicated to those who lost their lives in, in the Battle of 1812. And this is Lake Erie in Ohio on an island, you know. And it's at the put a bay okay. put, put a bay put in bay let me get it right put in bay yeah. and it's all the we i mean we were just talking about this yesterday um and it's all this history of the battle of 1812 and you forget how 
the English did come through on these waterways uh, between Canada and America, on the and like Lake Erie and all and on the lake side. We always kind of think of history, the British history coming in, and it's always the Mayflower side, you know, and, and like the New Hampshire or New England side. And you know, you think about the Boston Tea Party, but the eighteen, the Battle of eighteen twelve is fascinating, you know, that history. Well, it is, and, and yeah. that that was that was the whole reason I wanted to go out east was totally because of the the Battle of eighteen, the, or the War of eighteen twelve, because I I found. Um, mm -hmm. or several years ago now, that my ancestor um, in 1851 was a Chelsea pensioner. Now, I always thought a Chelsea pensioner was just the men in the red coat who live in Chelsea Hospital. But actually, he was a Chelsea out pensioner. So he had a pension from the army, uh, but he was allowed to live at home. So I then realized that he must have been in the army because a Chelsea pensioner used to be in the army. Um, so I looked up his army record and I found that um, he joined the army in 1813. And in 1815, he was invalided out of the army because he had ophthalmia. And he was then sent back to, um, to England. But the fact was, he was sent back to England from Halifax in Nova Scotia. Wow. And he had contracted this ophthalmia in Nova Scotia, in, uh, in Halifax. So I really wanted to go back to see where he was. Wow. Because, you know, I take people to where their ancestors were. And I know where he was born, because that's in, in a little village called Middleton near King's Lynn. And, you know, I know where he lived in, in England, but to think that one of my own ancestors, who was a, a Norfolk bloke, um, you know, and I know, I know what he was, and I know that he was um, five foot six and a half inches tall. Um, I knew he had brown hair, he had gray eyes, uh, he had wow. a pale complexion, and he was a shoemaker. Um, I know that because of his army record. Um, but he went all the way across to Nova Scotia. So I just wanted to go, and I went. I went to the um, the the present fort, um, which was built after he was there. So the, the one I saw wasn't the one that he saw, but it was in the same position. And I went to the record office in Halifax, and I got some information. I got some old maps, and I found out where he would have been uh, billeted while he was there. So I was able to go. And although nothing's left because it's all been built on, I know roughly where he was. Um, there are still a few buildings that were there when he was there. Um, there's a clock tower that is still there that um, he would have seen. Um, so it was it was quite mm. amazing for me to do what I normally do for other people, you know, to go across the Atlantic and and see where my ancestor was. Which was, That's amazing. And also, when you consider that that he had to sail from England all the way across the Atlantic in a little yeah. tiny boat, you know, it wouldn't have been a big boat, it wouldn't have been a steam boat, it would have been a sail boat, and then he had to sail all the way back again when he was invalided with this ophthalmia, which obviously has something to do with his eyes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I flew across the Atlantic, and it, it took me seven hours. You know, how long did it take him to sail across the Atlantic? I haven't found out yet, but wow. you know, it's amazing. He, he must have uh, he must have suffered. Wow, um, it's it's. Then when you get that's these stories, you know, you're keeping his story alive. That's yeah. that's what I think about family history is, is living history, right? Where you you find out these stories of your ancestors, where and sometimes they just get forgotten. If if all it is is you know birth records, death records, you yeah. know baptismal records. That's that's a number and a name, you know. Yes. But when you dig into the family history and you start piecing their life together, these are you're keeping their stories alive. Well, also, I think this is you know, so amazing. The, the the thing about you know digging more into people, um, you know, the fact that I know that he was five foot six and a half inches tall, you know, I I know that he had brown hair, mm -hmm. you know, wow. I knew he was a I know know that he was a shoemaker, you know, all of those things. 
are what makes him a real person. You know, mm-hmm. He is a real person to me. You know, right. he's a little bit shorter than I am because I'm not very tall. You know, and and I can I can see him. You know, I can see him because you know it tells me what he looked like. And army army descriptions are normally quite good because the old reason that they had a description on an army record is in case they mm. um, deserted so they could be found. Oh. So that's why if you see, you know, it says it's got a scar on his left cheek or whatever, that's so that he can buy, be identified and taken back to the army and then court-martialed. But that's why they've got descriptions. So, mm. I, you know, the description of him for me is, is fantastic, but it weren't done so that I knew what he looked like. It was done in case he, he deserted. But, you know, wow. finding out information about the real people makes them into real people, you know. Wow. And family history, to me, is about family history. It's not about names and dates. He's okay. only, you know, he's John Bailey. He was born in, in, uh, in Middleton in 1790. You know, that doesn't mean anything. This but is, now this that I know... Means- he was in the army and he was five foot six and a half, you know, I went to Halifax. He's a person. You know, he's you know real. we have the Baileys, the Baileys that we Yeah, know. we did. Yeah, yeah, in 1880s. Yeah, the 1880s, they were Confederate soldiers. They came around, uh, they came yeah. across um, from New England, I believe. No, I'm going to say Kentucky's in there. Oh my gosh, Kentucky's back in here again. I think <laughs> Brad's family was from Kentucky. But they mm-hmm. came across. Two Confederate soldiers, Drew Bailey and then another Julian ba- Bailey. Julian Bailey, yeah. And, and then we they, have the town of Julian yeah, right there. So one settled on the mountain, Palomar Mountain, and one settled on the mountains of Julian. And so they named the, you know, the towns, get their name, or, you know, near that. But they opened the post offices. They did mm-hmm. all this stuff. And it's, it's, it's amazing, the history. It is. Yep. I'm, you're going to end up, I'm telling you, you're going to, you are going to have to go to the mountains of se- Southern California. And p- if you go there and your family history is really connected there, it's going to blow your mind because yeah. they have the original stuff. I mean, they, they are living history. Is that the first post office? The first there? post office is there. The original buildings are there. Yeah. The original, you know, carts and everything, everything is there. Yeah. And and it's just it's trippy, man. <laughs> and mm-hmm. they've got all the historic cemeteries and and all of that, and they're still finding wow. the graves, and because they're apparently things move a little um, on the mountain. On the mountain, <laughs> um, yeah. so there's interesting things with that. But Glenn, this is I think this is, I mean if it doesn't inspire people to look into their family history, I don't know what what will. This is a, just an incredible journey. The photos are beautiful. I can't wait for everyone to go. Read your article, everyone. It's on nationalparktraveling.com. Uh, just type in Glenn and you'll find his articles. And also in the October through December issue of Parks and Travel magazine. Uh, also, don't forget, go to Glenn's website. That he just had in Canada is exactly what he does. This is coming. Um, if you want to find your family history, definitely call Glenn. And even if you need help, right? Uh, wherever you are in the world, if you need help getting documents or finding things over in England, any part of England, Scotland, Wales, just email Glenn through the website and it's norfolk-tours.co.uk. Thanks so much, Glenn, for sharing your story. Me on again. If I can, if I can help anybody, I'm always happy to. Awesome, awesome. Everybody, don't forget, keep up with us on BigBlendRadio.com for all our shows. We are Sunday through Friday. Kinds of outlets like Spotify, YouTube, TuneIn, all those. And uh, this song is from a a gentleman, Ed Roman. He is from Ontario. So he is just a little bit west of where you were, and um, his name is Ed Roman. So I figured we have to play Ed Roman for the Roman roads of England. (laughs) Exactly. Uh, But uh, this song is called I Am Love, and when you talk about family history, that's what it all boils down to. It does Um, indeed. 
and uh, yeah, this and I love this music. And any chance I get to play this song, I do. <laughs> and it's, anyway, it's from Ed Roman. You can go to edroman.net. It is off of his latest album. It's called Red Omen. And he's an awesome guy who loves to garden. And he posts really cool organic garden photos and food photos all the time on Instagram and Twitter. So check it out. Uh, but here it is. I am love. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks, Glenn. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. 